Welcome to the first ever Envelope Animation Roundtable. I am delighted. First, maybe last. For, let's hope yeah, not last. Be, it's it up depend, to you. Depending on how well this, go, this goes, guys. The future is in your hands. This could be first or last. So far, so. pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're off to The good news is we start. have really shy people, so. <laughs> yes. um, I wanted to start off by um, Something that I noticed as I was preparing for this conversation, which is that you're all first time feature filmmakers. You all have a lot yeah. of experience, but I thought that was, it was not by design, but really interesting to there's me. There's a lot of firsts. There's like a lot of firsts mm -hmm. in this yeah. room. Um, and I think only in animation would it be uh, with crews this big, with budgets this big, with productions this involved, that you'd be first time feature filmmakers. So I'll just put this out to the group. Is it daunting to make your first feature in animation where the stakes tend to be pretty high? I mean, I think for me, it was, it was, uh, like, the, 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 it was like a different type of daunting, maybe just, just to get it done. So it's actually not that much different from TV, yeah. where it's always like, you know, for TV, it's always schedule, schedule. You get that release, you know, the, you know your air, air date, date. Mm -hmm. and that's all you're fighting for. Mm -hmm. And so this was kind of the same thing where, in my situation, I stepped in, and it was like, all right, we got to get it done. And then you just got to, like, I felt like I didn't even do anything creatively because I was so busy trying to just push the train mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so uh, but that was for me. I don't know. Yeah, me, me and Genny kind of shared the same kind of 18-month schedule. We yeah. were asked to come on and, and, and take over, you know, our films. And it was very similar. I mean, there's still a lot of things that you had to do just to make the movie work you know and 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 then get it out on time as well yeah. mm -hmm. um and but i you know coming out of tv i don't mind that kind of pressure you know that schedule i'm used to that so mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't i mean i'd worked on incredibles and ratatouille and you know other big time features where you have a little you know you it seems like you have more time but i never just worked that slow mm -hmm. so this kind of felt right to me as as a speed i mean the other pressures are you know working at pixar it was they're very hard on what the film's going to turn out to be and if they're not happy i mean and that's not just you know john lasser and andrew stanton and ed catmull it's the, it's the, your crew mm -hmm. it's the people at pixar we show it we put it up we watch it and they come out and boy they don't hold back you know mm -hmm. the second <laughs> act was awful that thing sucked ass <laughs> uh, oops and uh you know and then you you turn it around you have you have to be able to identify those those problems and turn around as fast as you can that clock's always ticking but it, it didn't that didn't bother me or, or felt like any pressure, you know? Yeah, I think, I think, I think, think our think about head's too down to realize. Right. It was the night, mm -hmm. it was actually the night before we came out that all of a sudden I thought, oh my God, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> then, it, yeah. then it became, that's yeah, true. The, the, it's the like the night, night before you yeah. opened The night before you opened. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm lucky funny. that I, I or it could be, you know, a blessing or a curse that I was born without the sense of being daunted, oh. you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like, I look back on The Simpsons, you know, that first season of The Simpsons, and look back and think, what were we thinking? You know, how did we ever think we could get this done? Yeah. You know, but it, I never thought it in the moment, right. you know, and kind of the same thing. And I agree with, with Gendy that it wasn't until the thing was all finished yeah. where I look back in retrospect and think, was I crazy? Right. You know, right. to just kind of jump and run into a burning building. And, you know, it's, I think it's, we all share that kind of sense of, loving the medium and wanting to kind of just get in there and, and be a part of it and, and do our best. But that is what it's like. I mean, I know for me it was, you know, I, I don't come out of TV, but, you know, I've, I've worked at uh, DreamWorks, you know, a couple of years had a story, story artist. So I've been through a couple of productions and before that, you know, uh, storyboard, a lot of live action films. So I've been through the production mill a bunch of times. I came on and it's like you just kind of parachute into, you yeah. know, enemy territory behind the lines and you just go. Yeah. And you're, you know, there's <laughs> so many memory. things to think about. Yeah, it yeah. literally is. Yeah. There's so many things to, you know, deal with and think about. As what Gandhi said, I, I feel exactly the same way. It literally wasn't until we were just about done that I was like, oh my God, what happened? What, what is, what, yeah. what what is did this? we do? <laughs> yeah. And why do I feel so empty? <laughs> yeah. right. oh, yeah. and I think well, that says a lot about <laughs> me. You know? That's where I'm <laughs> living. <laughs> Uh, like for me, especially, it was like an element of a dream come true. Yeah. Like you're yeah. you know, pitching for seven years to try to get a movie going, and then yeah. finally you're in there. 
I remember it was our first animation review, and, uh, and I went in the auditorium, and it's like what you dream of, you have little scrapbooks of Disney sitting with his guys in the sweat box and stuff, so it's like a dream come true. And there's my animators, and I sit down in this theater, it's like, wow, this is actually happening, you know, mm. the animation review. And they show a shot, and I was like, oh, that's great, and I'm waiting for somebody <laughs> to make a comment. Mm -hmm. And everybody's looking at me, I'm like, oh, right, I'm the director, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta speak up. And, but it was like a, it's a great yep. moment, so you don't, you don't think about the pressure again, you're thinking about it, wow, here I am actually doing it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that was definitely my experience, was this dream come true. At no point, I don't think, you know, I was writing this for so many years, not all the time, just on and off, mm -hmm. but I never expected to, for someone to actually say, yeah, we're gonna go with this, mm -hmm. and yes, you're gonna be the only writer, mm. and I'm not gonna mm. interfere. Um, wow. So I think I should have been more daunted <laughs> than I was, um, but it was, it was such a dream come true that it would have been idiotic not to just jump into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're born without daunt. Well, no, we have no well, yeah, I don't think you want, I don't think you want to think about that. I don't think you want to think about that, <laughs> yeah. think about that aspect of it. You never get out of bed. Of that, right. that hurdle yeah, that you'd true. have to do, it's mm -hmm. very kind of, your blinders are on and you're just dealing with, I mean, the thing that I love about storytelling, it's, it's, a, it's a problem puzzle. And I love yep. to solve the problems. And then when you expand that out from just storytelling to, to your writing, to dealing with your animators, to where the motivations of the characters, to where you want to put this light for the lighters, to design and building sets and stuff like this, they all just become about going in and solving those mm -hmm. problems yep. on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, um, getting into that, uh, interpretation of what you have in your head mm -hmm. to get to your artist so they can mm -hmm. turn it around for you um, without trying not to lead them down too many paths. And I think for, for, for me, there is, this, there is this strange idea that I have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them, I don't know what yep. the hell I want you know, I don't know where I want to go on this because I don't have enough information. I'm, I'm more reactive. Mm -hmm. And, and some, that would turn some people off or they go, hey, he doesn't know what he's doing. But then as soon as I see something, I go, that's, that's it. it. And they go, mm -hmm. and on the reverse, they go, why? And I'm all, I don't know. <laughs> I just, my gut is saying yes. That's so it. I'm sniffing down right. that, that trail and that problem until things start to happen. So it, it's very organic and flexible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to take that and stuff it on a schedule that you have to be done by a certain time, you don't want to look at it. it, it right. Those two things don't go together and mm -hmm. it's impossible. It's impossible, yeah. you know? And, and I think, you know, that really speaks to, because I, I agree with Mark, you know, it does feel like we're solving puzzles, or I would always picture it that I was kind of working on my crossword puzzle, mm -hmm. right. and then the, the, the group like at Pixar and at, at, uh, at Disney, um, we, we have, you know, meetings where we, we watch each other's films, you know, and get together, and it's almost like, I put my puzzle away for a while and help somebody else on their puzzle, you know, and it, it, it's a really good feeling of kind of being able to collaborate with, with people all working on their puzzles and trying to kind of make them to fill in all the words, you know, and make it the, the best puzzle. This is a horrible analogy. <laughs> <where it's going. laughs> well, let's start at the beginning of the puzzle. Sure. I mean, the first thing you have to do is talk people into letting you make your movie, right? I mean, you have to, you have a pitch. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about, and, and Rich, maybe you could talk about how this worked on Wreck-It sure. Ralph. You go in with your idea, or perhaps it's multiple ideas. How do you communicate that first to the execs and then to your, your team? Well, um, in, in the way it works at Disney and at Pixar, it's the same because John Lasseter is the kind of the creative overseer of both uh, Pixar and Disney animation, is that, that John likes to hear multiple pitches for ideas. You know, he doesn't want to just hear one kind of precious idea that, that someone is working on. He, he likes to hear multiple pitches because it kind of frees up the mind to, you know, not focus in on one thing and just kind of get so spun around one idea that, mm -hmm. that you can't um, uh, consider other things. So in my case, I was working on a few ideas and then John uh, kind of took me aside and he said, you know what, we really, we really wanted to do something about video games here at the studio for, for a long time, you know, and uh, we just, it's this, this kind of notion of a, a movie about video games has been kind of in the ether here and just never got, you know, traction and never took off. You, and we just put it on the shelf again, you know, a year ago. So um, 
if you wouldn't mind, if one of your pitches, you could just consider, you know, the world of video games, you know, and not going back to any of the other material that, that was worked on before, but just, you know, if you want, think about that. And uh, for me, it was like, well, I love video games, you know, and it seems like a really great world to kind of mine. So um, I began to kind of work on, on that idea and include it in the group of of pitches that, that I presented to John. Mm -hmm. And do you have, um, and this is for any of you, do you have something that you do when you're preparing to make a pitch? And I don't just mean to the exec, but when you're talking to yeah. your animators or your story team, how do you communicate that idea when it's just up here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, people get caught up in enthusiasm, mm -hmm. right? And your yeah. own passion for it. Mm -hmm. So I remember sitting down, um, I was pitching some ideas and, and I was telling Andrew this one idea that I had and he, he, he loved it. And this was, we were just sitting down. I think we were, it was when we were working on John Carr Mars and we were sitting in London having dinner after a shoot. I just told him this one idea that I had. He's like, that's fantastic. And then later on, when I had a formal pitch, I pitched an idea, he took me aside. He said, oh, that was awful. The way, you, <laughs> the way you pitched was awful. I'm all, what went wrong? He's all, I don't know. But when you're telling me a story that you know from your heart of something that happens to you, you cut out the academics. Mm -hmm. You cut out the beginning, middle, and end. You know what information is important mm -hmm. and the hierarchy of that information, and it just comes out organically. That's what your pitches need to be. So I went, okay, don't prepare. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do now. I just come in and prepare. It's like, hey, uh, Pete, I got to tell you this story. Okay, it begins with the, the, the. And then it just happens, mm -hmm. and they get it. And that's mm -hmm. what I, that's how I pitched to John. and. Mm -hmm. Andrew and Ed, that's how I pitch to, to my crew or my, my story buddies or my friends. Mm -hmm. And the more that I pitch it, just the more that you get comfortable yeah. with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think like, you know, in, in my situation, it was very unique because it was like, a, you know, it was an abused property, you know, <laughs> you know there getting been beat upon. Directors yeah, multiple directors, the full the gamut. I saw commercial for the project, <laughs> that's right. you know. It, it was, was, yeah, it was, was nice uh, of you to and so your like, wallet in your heart. And, and knowing all that, knowing that the story crew's beaten down, the, you know, everybody's beaten down, the executives, everybody, I have to come in there and I have to have conviction. You know, that's, like the only, that's the only thing I can have to win everybody over is that, right. to pretend that I know what I'm doing and convince everybody, you know, that I'm doing it. And then we had this amazing three and a half hour uh, meeting fight with, uh, you know, the heads of the studios and stuff because she wanted to trust somebody with this, with this you know, because I think it's, when you're, especially when you're starting out as a lot of animation directors are, and it's your first movie, you just want to say yes. You know, yeah, I'll do it your way, I'll figure out a way to make that work. And I felt like for me, this is the wrong opportunity. Like, I gotta be, like, even if she's right, I'm gonna say no. You know, no, we can't do that because this is that. <laughs> And it, and it totally, that's why I love <laughs> it totally works. But that's the thing, it's like you, you know, like when you compare to live action, you know, a lot of live action directors are very strong minded and, mm -hmm. and, you know, they don't get, you know, bullied over, they fight. And so I felt like I had to do that. You know, I had to stand up for what I believed in, even though if I'm not even there yet, story wise, you know. And same thing with the crew. I came in and the story crew like attacked me. Right. You know, with all this, because they've been there, they've been right. through Literally, it. Yeah. You know, like, well, we did yeah. that two years ago, and they're and vicious. Story crews are notorious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They come at me with knives. They'll, they'll let you know how yes, they it's true everywhere. It's got to yeah. be tough love. No quality punches. Yeah. So I went, like, I went the opposite of what Mark was doing. I, I, I said, I know exactly what I want. This is what I want. You have to do this, this, and that. You know, in a nice way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then slowly, luckily, it was working, and I was started to win, win everybody over. Mm -hmm. You know, but initially it was, it was rough because it was just, yeah. everything well, was questioned. And coming from TV, we're a team. We're one unit, and everybody's going right, for one yeah. goal. And there's yeah. no defiance in the ranks, so to speak. You know, I mean, there's because conversations. The are stuff. So, so short. Yeah. You, you yeah. are always behind. Yeah, and you're never finished drawing. You're already, it's already mm -hmm. gone. Right. Now, Chris, yeah. Lake is a very different kind of studio. Yeah. Tell us how it works there. I had a completely different experience in that I didn't <laughs> pitch my project at all. Um, I was working on Coraline, head of story on Coraline, and I had the story. I had like the first 30 pages of the script written mm -hmm. up, and I wanted someone's perspective on it that could be you know, truly, brutally honest. So I gave it to Henry Selig, because I knew if it was no good, he would tell me. You mm -hmm. know. And instead, he, he just said, where's the rest? 
Mm. And I, I was like, oh, it's at home. And it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going home every, every night. <laughs> so for, uh, while I was still working on Coraline, I was writing the rest. But he said, let's show this to Travis. Because you know, we were talking about what, what, what do we follow Coraline with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's Travis Knight, the CEO and producer and animator. Um, and he, he, he did the same thing. He just said, yeah. I mean, literally, he went, yeah. And then I'm sat there going, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it was, it was, it, I think having it on paper first and kind of not doing that pitch process, you know, like as a new studio, so it, we're still learning how, how everything works there and I'm sure it won't be the same on all projects, but being able to just go, that's my idea, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, we did have to get into the pitch process for when we were looking for distribution and obviously, you know, just dealing with the crew mm -hmm. that's a, that's a different thing but initially it was it yeah very bizarre and very different very unusual i think to get a project started mm -hmm. that way mm -hmm. and to be to have someone a studio executive to get so completely behind it and champion it from from day one and not not really want to do anything with it i mean not well, not want to change it at least but to support it and champion it so i'm lucky there's a rush yeah, for just, Oregon right now. The plane, yeah. Everyone's hopping on the plane. <laughs> they just accept <laughs> scripts, <laughs> Kenny. <laughs> what are we That's doing? Just told, just told it's at home. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Here's a page. Here's a title. It's at home. It's about a cup. I love it. No. Um, it was a good in <laughs> your perspective on this next question, yeah. because in Rise of the Guardians, you had a lot of strong creative personalities involved. Right. You have Bill Joyce, who wrote the books. Mm -hmm. You had Guillermo del Toro, who was a kind of consulting producer. Mm -hmm. David Lindsay Abair is a screenwriter, but ultimately the buck stops with the director. And I'm curious. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, when you have sort of a lot of strong creative people mm -hmm. coming at you with ideas, how do you filter it and, and make sense of it? Uh, you know, l luckily, I, had a, I was pretty secure in what I saw for the film in terms of the tone and the, really the tone. That was the thing I kind of held on to and mm -hmm. the, just this core idea that, you know, pretty early on uh, in, in my little pitch to the studio, because, you know, we were kind of between iterations and they weren't 100% sure what was going to happen. But my, my first notes were about, you know, thinking, you know, people... When you're, when you're a kid, you actually do believe in these guys, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's trying to protect that core, that, that idea of, of the characters as icons that you actually have a personal relationship to, that I, I kind of said, you know what, let's not do a satire, let's not make it a parody, let's kind of play with that idea of taking this seriously, which luckily, writer David Lindsay Abair was thinking along the same line, so the stars kind of lined up there. And just kind of staying true to that was sort of enough to like be able to keep everybody else at bay because everybody felt good about that core concept. Mm -hmm. So if anything kind of like, you know, went counter the, to that or at a slightly different angle, uh, you know, I guess it was a vision, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, uh, that helped, you know, having something that secure. I mean, in terms of like, you know, minutia, stuff like that, I'm sort of, I'm kind of like, you know, bring it on. If it's a great idea, if somebody else has got it, I want to hear it because I love to be surprised. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, you know, I'd have stuff, you know, Roger Deakins was doing visual consulting with mm -hmm. us. I mean, it's, it, it, which is incredible, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, but I, I still, you know, I, I, maybe it's back to the self-delusion thing, but, you know, Guillermo or Roger or David or whoever, I, I, I felt perfectly comfortable with all of them because they're, they're pretty generous collaborators to kind of like, eh, I don't think that's quite right, or mm -hmm. eh, you know, and there were, you know, a few tussles here and there, but generally not with those guys, so it was, uh, it was kind of like a dream, actually, mm -hmm. that part of it. Mm -hmm. How much do you all rely on screenings to, to let you know if you're on the right track, either internally at the studio or the wider screening process? Yeah, but I, at Pixar and Disney, it's, it's big time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I had a saying that the proof was in the pudding. I could have John and Andrew Stanton sitting in a room with me, my story crew, and a bunch of other people, and we could be talking till the cows come home about how to mm -hmm. handle a scene or something. And all of that is, it's nothing yeah. until you see it. Mm -hmm. So we had to put it together, get it, time it, get the voices in there, put music in there, and put it up 
So like when you really go and see a movie, mm -hmm. then you can react to it and see, you know, it was working until that part, mm -hmm. you know, and then it unraveled mm -hmm. or it's not working at all or it's, oh, it's so tired and cliche, you know, mm -hmm. then you could start to analyze what you got and make those adjustments. So the screening process is, is the huge process and it's the only process that I really listen to. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily, because there's so many ways to skin a cat right. in the room thinking about the idea right. mm -hmm. and people pulling out books on screenwriting mm -hmm. or books on you know, how a, a scene should play or where motivation comes from or, or everybody's experiences making films. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but it's never gonna work the same way twice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they may be good ideas and you could intellectually solve it, but until you see it, then you really know because it's yeah. that you're reacting to and it. And it's really funny because uh, I didn't believe in test screenings because from yeah. TV, I hated uh, focus groups. Mm. Like I never had a good focus group and I never trusted it. It's like 12 people in the room and they judge your life, mm -hmm. you know? And it's totally different because TV, you watch by yourself. So it's a totally different experience. So going to our first test screening, I was really nervous because I wasn't sure. And boy, did I love it because it was yeah. the same thing. It's like I felt myself with the audience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I could, even though I've seen it a thousand times, I felt what the audience was feeling, and then I could see like, oh yeah, this is way too slow up here, or way mm -hmm. too fast, or that joke's not landing. Mm -hmm. And then we started, because we were making a, you know, a big comedy, we had a lot of jokes, and then it would be like, well, I like this joke, and then they go, well, I like this joke. And then we would put up in test screening and see which joke would win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so even, right. even you, you trust the audience, and, uh, and I always worried that even the test screening audience would be different than the real one. Mm -hmm. And then when I compared the two, like slightly different, but generally pretty mm -hmm. close. You know, so it was, I used it as a tool, you know, I fixed a lot of gags because, you know, like one thing in TV, like, you know, that you're always timing for, well, people should be laughing here. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a really dangerous thing right. because mm -hmm. if they're not, then it's just the slow <laughs> pause right. in, the, cricket, in the thing. Cricket. So I'm really scared of that. So now going into mm -hmm. a thing where you could sit with an audience and like in some cases, people were laughing into the next joke. Mm -hmm. And so the next joke totally failed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I would okay. be, had an opportunity to open it up. And then sure enough, right. both jokes would get good laughs. Mm -hmm. right, right. And so that was a great tool to use to, yeah. to, for the comedy. It's great how it like, those screenings, they just take all the ambiguity out of it. Yep. It's like, right. cause you yeah. can, very, very it's true. Scary. You're sitting yeah. in editorial and you're like, you just like angels on the head of a pin. You're like arguing, you know, four more frames here. No, that's not right. No, the music stops here. No, that's not right. Eh, eh. But man, you look at it, if it's not funny, it's not funny. If, mm -hmm. if nobody's it's crying, emotional. it's not emotional, right. you know? And it's, I, I really love that about being able to watch it with an audience and really test it. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, you really know. It's interesting though, you know, when you do crew screenings, because certainly when you like screen for the story team, once you've had that first screening, that you can't ever have that again. Yeah. You can't ever just wipe yeah. the whole movie out of your mm -hmm. head mm -hmm. and see it fresh. And that sometimes becomes problematic well at least for me sometimes I used to start thinking how do I remove myself how do I get all this baggage from the last two years out of my head so that I'm seeing this completely unbiased again for the first time and you can't which is why it's good to see it with a group of completely yep. fresh people mm -hmm. the interesting thing for me on this was I was a little concerned about how um, kids would react to the scariness of it. Well, talk about that a little bit. I mean, this is something anybody making an animated movie has to think about, mm -hmm. which is that mm -hmm. by design, at least in this yeah. marketplace, it's a family movie. It is, right. and, that, and family movie doesn't necessarily just mean, you know, laughs. It, I think you can have scary family movies, and mm -hmm. a big influence on this was the family movies that I loved when I was a kid. It's very 80s influenced, mm -hmm. um, which were, you know, quite irreverent mm -hmm. at times. Um, and I wanted to get some of that. So it was definitely an ongoing discussion. Every day we talked about it. Where's the line? Are we crossing it? How far can we go? The interesting thing for me was that quite often when we would scream to kids, the kids are fine. Mm -hmm. It's the their parents yeah. who were like, right. they're scared. They start second yeah. guessing it. Right. We yeah. had the same right. thing on Brave because all of a sudden I put this killer bear in there that's a monster yeah. in this that horrifying That scared the thing. hell out of me. Goodness. <laughs> and, My daughter and, won't watch it. Yeah, and <laughs> your daughter won't watch it. And uh, she will when she grows up. Um, but that was one thing that we were talking about too because it had a darker nature. And, right. and, and one thing that in a film there has to be stakes or yeah. it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. You right. can't Absolutely. care if somebody's not in peril or you don't care about them, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's that, it's that weird line of how far do you push it? Mm -hmm. And we do it, and, you know, we make it, we watch it, and we see, 
um, where, where it is, but it was a concern. I mean, it got talked about tons and tons and tons and tons. Is, is, it, is it dark? And I would get questioned about it, and i go, look, people, this is a warning, right? That's what you're looking at when a child is turning into an adult. They're going into a world where these consequences matter, and they're going to get stomped on. I want to give my children, as a parent, and a, 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 I want to give them the tools to say, look, it is scary and you're gonna survive, mm -hmm. right? Trust the filmmaker, trust the yeah. storyteller, we're not gonna steer you wrong, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, that, and yeah. that was always the, the, the place that I, that I came from. I mean, even in putting trailers out there to the world to start telling people about the movie, there's is stuff, there's right? an element of darkness in there you gotta know. Yeah. And I reference yeah. Bambi, I reference Dumbo, mm -hmm. you know? There are scary Disney movies that mm -hmm. people have Absolutely. grown up with. Absolutely, the promotional stuff of Paranorman, that, that comes up again and again and again, and, you keep saying, you know, good children's fiction has scares, right. and it yeah. always has done. You go back as far as fairy tales, yeah. as far as the written word, mm -hmm. and challenges are presented to kids as a means of teaching them how, of empowering them, mm -hmm. and teaching them how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. You know, Neil Gaiman always talked about it on Coraline that um, it's okay to show monsters as long as you show that they can be defeated, yeah. Yeah. and I think that's I the key with thing. That. Yeah. That's yeah. that's our movie in a really our movie in a nutshell. I mean, our bad guy is the boogeyman. Right. You know, he's coming out from the shadows and from under kids' beds and whatnot. So, yeah, naturally it was a, it was a, an ongoing concern for us in the line, but, you know, it's, it, I could take what you said and yeah. just like, you know, plug it into my brain and let it come out of my mouth. It's, it's the exact same thing. The whole story is about how do you defeat or deal with fear? How do you mm -hmm. acknowledge that it's real? That's kind of the, the lesson of, of our movie. So it has to be a real thing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's got to have some teeth. Mm -hmm. um, right. And we haven't, and, and I don't think, we haven't had a single walkout of any kid. I mean, and we've had some young ones. Oh. We've had four-year-olds, three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. No walkouts, because I think you, uh, uh, you understand the motivation of the bad guy for one thing, so he's a kind of a person, not just a monster, but also they win in the end, you know? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, it's, and even, even the darkness has a little bit of elegance and a little bit of magic to it. Mm. So, hmm. I think, I think kids are all, you know, I keep getting um, asked at what age group is this okay for? Mm -hmm. And the more you hear that question, the more you think, you know, it's, it's actually dependent on the kid and, yeah. and, and, you know, parents know their kids. I yeah. know three-year-olds who've seen Paranorman and aren't faced by it, but 10-year-olds who, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, My three-year-old grew up watching Aliens, <laughs> <laughs> so he's totally fine. Right. He's totally but I think, cool. I think, it's, a, it's, a, sorry, I think yeah. it's a issue with the animation industry where everybody's trying to make one movie, mm -hmm. yeah. rather than we can have mm -hmm. a kid scary movie or a more action, mm -hmm. you know, real movie, and a stupid, you know, silly comedy, mm -hmm. you know, and I think you were, everybody's required to make one type of movie, mm -hmm. you know, and that's subtly maybe changing a little bit, but it's, yeah. it's rough because you know it's like in the old days everybody was trying to make a Disney film right you right, know? right but then if somebody could break free and make something different it could be just as successful but right. just yeah. different and that's so the exciting time that we're kind of coming into yeah, I think so is that is yeah. that I mean with, with Rise, Wreck-It, Paranormal, yeah, I mean uh, Total yeah. Trans the, the broadness of the yeah. spectrum that's mm -hmm. going out there especially since we've kicked it up into PG now as yeah. well mm -hmm. right. so we go from G to PG I mean there's a lot yeah. more room to go around yeah. for, for mm -hmm. families and that is was something that I said PG well yeah. I said to we're them in, in the yeah. beginning you know I'm making a movie about video games games they have violence in them there's yeah. a lot of conflict there's a lot of stress and you know uh, action so this is going to be a PG film mm -hmm. you know we're not going to be able to make a movie mm -hmm. about video games and rated G mm -hmm. you know right. it's not going to be graphic you know it's not going to be horrifying and bloody but there will be you know there will be action and there mm -hmm. will be a certain amount of violence you mm -hmm. know yeah. and then it was for me it was just a, a balancing act of of okay, there can be you know there can be gunplay, but it's all science fiction, and there's a certain amount of levity to it, and, mm -hmm. you know, and those are the types of things I like anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. but going back to something you said um, uh, earlier, like there was a lot of talk in the press about the three monster-related horror, scary kids right, movies right. this year. But if you actually put them together, they're each so different, different. Yeah. from yeah. one yeah. another, yeah. and that is exciting to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they're also, they're very sweet, like yeah. at their heart. Mm -hmm. they're, they have just such a, a great kind of emotional story, every one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, it's not about, it's not, they're not horror right. movies. Right, you exactly, know, they're, yeah. They're in the genre, you know, of kind right. of a monster movie, but at the heart of it is a, is a very kind of 
relatable human story, mm -hmm. I think. Let's talk about working with voice actors. Um, Gendy, what was Adam Sandler like to work with? I know he has his own ideas about yeah. comedy. How did you handle that? I mean, it was it was it was really interesting, and it was a great experience for me because it was always you know it's uh, you know I think Adam's really funny, and uh, and so now you have somebody let's say if they write a joke, you know, which he depends on his expression and his timing to to tell the joke, mm -hmm. you know, and then when he tells it, it's really funny, but now it falls into my hands. Now I've got to get Dracula to tell the same joke, mm -hmm. you know, using his voice, and that like that became a certain a different type of pressure because I had to perform on that level uh, where before I would just write my own stuff and it would like you didn't think about it, right. you know, mm -hmm. and so that was that was complex, and I had a whole th you know a whole group of comedians that I had to do that with, you know, how do you deliver Steve Buscemi's lines mm -hmm. that are so funny, you know, mm -hmm. and and so it was a really great exercise for me to tell you know to get a joke and then now execute it and, and tell it the right way, mm -hmm. you know. And it was great, it was, you know, I remember this thing where, you know, I did a little bit of writing also and, and I remember when the first time I was sitting in a room with Adam, some of his guys and Robert Smigel and all these really funny, you know, professional comedians, mm -hmm. you know, and they were all riffing on the story. And it's, they're doing the same thing that we've mm -hmm. always done, mm -hmm. except now they're, you know, they're certified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, they have a degree. They have a card. <laughs> That's right. They have yeah. a card. Yeah. It's yeah. It's all wallet. wallet. They have that, there's the a card USDA yeah. They have that SNL pedigree. That's right. You know? And so, uh, and but so you I'm, have Emmys, so you just <laughs> line up your Emmys. Right. And so, uh, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm super, um, uh, you know, like I'm super nervous about it. And I came up with a joke. Like, oh, I, I shouldn't say it because if they hate it, it's, it's the worst thing saying a joke and everybody just like looks at you. You know, this is in the beginning. And that's like, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to say it. And if they don't like it, they can fire me. Mm -hmm. I don't care, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and I said the joke and then Adam and everybody laughed and it makes you feel so good because now yeah. all of a sudden you're operating. I mean, like, hey, yeah, I can write, right, I can write exactly. SNL. That's fine. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> made my bones. <laughs> and, uh, and so it felt really good, but working, it's, you know, it's very collaborative and they are super serious about the comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know we try to work out story and character, but for them, for sure, it's the mm -hmm. comedy. You know, if, if the joke isn't landing or they're going to, you know, they're going to perform it many times over and over again to get it right. Mm -hmm. And the joke is very serious. And mm -hmm. so, like, for me, like, sometimes we throw away stuff in TV where it's like, oh, you know, some people laugh and it's fine. It's mm -hmm. not a big deal. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. But here, especially in the features, because you only have that was 90 minutes or whatever, everything's got to land. And so it was like, it was scrutinizing over each joke mm -hmm. was a, you know, a different lesson for me. Mm -hmm. How did you find dealing with Alec Baldwin in a Russian accent? Uh, <laughs> Alec Baldwin, he's a legend. Actually, uh, he's incredible. I, 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 uh, he's North. The he's North, Santa our version of Santa Claus. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the, he's, he's gotta be one of the funniest guys I've ever, I've ever met, ever experienced in my life. I mean, we'd have our recording sessions blocked out for like, you know, three hours, four hours. Easily the first 45 minutes of it, would be Alec coming in and just kind of like, it's almost like he'd be launching into a stand-up routine. I mean, just like, I think it's a way of warming up, but the guy's just hilarious. We'd literally be rolling on the floor laughing at, uh, he'd, he'd do impersonations, he'd, you know, Robert De Niro, Woody Allen, I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. And like, you know, giving this little window into his life. But uh, once we got into the booth, the amazing thing was, I mean, because the Russian accent, you know, we kind of got through that pretty quickly. And at first he was like, am I from Minsk? Am I from, you know, Smolensk? Am I, you know, what there is a And it just, <laughs> <there. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> it just, it just kind of turned into this, you know, he, he just didn't want to sound like Boris Badenov. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we got something that he felt, you know, okay with and that like had the right, you know, tone for the character. And uh, the amazing thing was how well he knows his instrument, mm -hmm. his voice, because I think of all the cast, he was the most experienced pure voice actor. Mm -hmm. And he'd go in and we, you know, I'd talk him through and he'd, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 and slip into character mm -hmm. and he'd start, you know, doing takes and he'd just kind of go and he'd kind of riff a little, but he was very attentive to the line as written because mm -hmm. it was, you know, it's David Lindsay, a bear playwright, and mm -hmm. he had a lot of respect for that. But he'd like, you know, get deeper and deeper in. And sometimes I'd go, he'd give some takes and I'd go, oh, wow, Alec, that's great. And I'd, you know, could you try one where, you know, this, that, the other thing. And he's, oh, I, I don't know, I think we might have that. I mean, I'll do another one if you want, but I think we might have it. Mm -hmm. And he'd, you know, he'd oblige me and go ahead and do it. We'd listen, you know, through the selects, like, you know, that afternoon, and he'd listen to it and I'd go, oh my God, 
he was right. That's so much different from the one before that, even mm -hmm. though I couldn't tell it in the booth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he knew, you know, he could gauge it and he could judge it. And listening to it afterwards, it, it was amazing how, it was kind of uncanny mm -hmm. how much he could get in that. You really couldn't, liter couldn't yeah. tell while you were there. It was Does weird. It influence your character design or is that pretty much it, yeah on brave on brave they had I, I came in i kind of inherited most of the characters except for merida we got kelly mcdonald to come in um so she i got to kind of work with kind of from scratch i mean we know that merida is going to be this feisty you know scottish right. lass and stuff like that but a teenager as well and she's all oh i don't like teenagers you know and yeah. she she kind of channeled her inner teenager which came out <laughs> like that yeah. and she was just a surprise because she doesn't play that type of character she right. plays a shyer quieter character and now she can just go all out mm -hmm. and and it just kind of blossomed right there she could get fierce and yell and stuff like this i she can cry in a in a heartbeat, right? I mean, and we're all sitting there going, "So sorry, I had to make you read that line." <laughs> you know, getting her to laugh was like pulling teeth. <laughs> She's not that kind of person. Right. You know what I mean? So I have to do the most crazy, asinine stuff in the room to get her to even laugh. I'd have to trick her and whatnot. I'm all good enough. Okay, we got one. Let's keep going on to the series. Oh, Let's I'm give that some credit. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But it's crazy. But all of them, I gave. You know, I wrote the script, I gave it to them. Um, so they have what the scene is kind of about, mm -hmm. but because they were all Scottish, I said, however you can Scotsify this, go. I want ad-libs from everybody, and Emma Thompson being a writer in her own right and a director, it was fantastic working with her because she would go off and we'd talk about the scene structure and this and how, you know, what is the, I mean, beyond just the motivation of her character. Mm -hmm. And Billy, I mean, Billy was a lot mm -hmm. like, Ali. he'd come in and it would be like five minutes recording, 30 minutes of laughing on the floor. Yeah. Five minutes recording, 30 <laughs> minutes of laughing on the floor. Because he would just go off. But I really wanted their input and make it very collaborative. Because mm -hmm. that was something that I found when I was working in live action, is that you have that, you can try stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And in animation, there's, there's, because you've already kind of decided in storyboards and you've written the script, when you get it there, where's that kind of serendipity yeah, exactly. moment? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, you know, bust the lid yeah. on it a little mm -hmm. bit because I'm still having to piece back a performance yeah. later after I've recorded them mm -hmm. to get something because they don't record in the room you, together and there's that yeah, dynamic yeah. too. You gotta well, get the spontaneity from someplace. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. And, and I, I agree with what Mark is saying that you don't, I, I chose John C. Riley because I knew that he would find areas of this character that, that I would not know, you know, and it's going yeah. back to not knowing everything mm -hmm. about the character, mm -hmm. you know, so he, he was a great partner in that way that we would talk about Ralph, he would kind of go, you know, into these areas that, that I'd be amazed, like, that's perfect, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that's perfect, and I would never have thought of that, but yeah. him being in the skin of the character, mm -hmm. you know, just he was able to find those things. And um, we, we had a little bit of a different process where um, we thought it was just kind of silly that this was the first time that John and Sarah Silverman were working together in a movie. They were friends, you know, they've known each other for a long time, but this was the first time working together ever. So it felt silly that, well, shouldn't the audience be, if the audience is going to see John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman for the first time, you know, together in a movie, they want to feel the chemistry between them, you know, so we, we uh, uh, facilitated to, to work, you know, together, to have them in the room together, to kind of play off one another, just to get exactly what Mark is saying. As opposed to separate booths. As, as opposed to usually done. in feature yeah. animation that it's, it's one actor by himself recording, mm -hmm. And, and John, when I first met him, he, he said, look, I've, I've always wanted to do animation. But, you know, I was talking to Jack Black about it one time, and he said, oh, John, you're gonna love it. It's just, it's just you in a booth, and you're just kind of riffing, you know, in this dark room and, you know, making stuff up. And he said, I didn't want to tell him, but that sounds horrible to me. I just don't, I just, I don't like that. Yeah. I don't want to be, you know, just floating in a vacuum. I, right. I like people, and I like working off of people. And I said, well, I like that too. So, um, so I made it happen that, that we were all able to work together, you know, and that the actors could look into each other's eyes and that, that, um, 
that we could we could record we could record clean and then I would let them step on each other's lines and just so we could have so we could get exactly what Mark is talking mm -hmm. about yeah. that that real spontaneity uh, in the performance because the animation process is so long you know mm -hmm. and so non spontaneous yeah, it's you know that it's, 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 yeah. it just rings yeah. spontaneity yeah. out of that every inch of it yeah. you know yeah. that I feel like my job from you know the first things I've ever worked on that my job was always to make it appear to the audience that they're watching this thing happen before their eyes right you yeah. know that we, it's, had, we had exactly the same yeah. thing I, in it was part of the you know part of the puzzle for this was to try and make it feel like the real world as yeah. well and that goes back to something you were saying about that sense of, of jeopardy a sense yeah. of real mm -hmm. stakes and so I wanted the the kid characters to be authentically children yes. mm -hmm. and not seem mm -hmm. scripted where possible right. and we we were lucky enough to get Cody Smith McPhee who's a fantastic ah. actor um, so we knew he could carry it because he's vulnerable and he's smart but he's also quite subtly funny as well um, but then we had Neil the sidekick character, mm -hmm. um, and Tucker Albritzi, who, who played him, didn't have that much experience, and he had a very different way of doing things, but it, when we started to hear it, he had such a, a strange way of delivering the lines that it worked perfectly, because you wouldn't direct it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and, and I think that's the director's job, too, yeah. is to realize in each of your people, from the actors to the animators to all the artists, the technicians, everyone has their own way of getting, you know, it's just like Mark said, yeah. skinning the cat, you yeah. know. And it's our job to kind of facilitate how, you know, what is the best way to get them there, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, to deliver them, you know, to the end of the line rather than saying to them, no, I want you to go right down there yeah. and or, do it exactly or like or this. Or recognize it, just right. recognize yeah. it. Yeah. You kind of have a, an ear for these pieces. Mm -hmm. You, you have a you have a direction that you want to go, right. but you may not know north. exactly how yeah. to get there. We're and, going and north, so you can get so, swayed a little mm -hmm. this way, or find a little something this way, and and, and at the but end it's it's cumulative and yeah. additive. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I think like you it's, have it at the end. It's a really good point because it's it took me a while. Like you know, you have a, you have a vision. You know, I had a very strong vision for things, and then you get something different, and it's, sometimes it's so different. You're like, ah, oh, no. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah. um, like I find this a lot with character design. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I would get something so different that's one in my head because I visualize right, yeah. everything, mm -hmm. and I saw it, and it's so different. And then I and I'd say no, like initially, like just instantly, right. no. And then <laughs> then I go home, and it's just yeah. in my yeah. mind the whole time, this design, yeah. and I keep yeah. thinking about it, like no, that's there's something there, there's something magical there. And I come back the next day and go, let's go with this. Yeah. And let's try it. And mm. it, you know, it's it's that, <clears throat> it's knowing when it is right even though yeah. It's, yeah. it's not what you were thinking right. initially. And right. that's the difference between TV and, and features, I think, or one of the big ones, is TV, you really have yeah. to kind of, you have to get it right the first time right. or absolutely the second time. Hmm. I mean, you really, or, you know, you'll never get anything done. You just won't make it in time. You won't yeah. make the air date. Where in features, there is that more kind of organic breathing room yeah. where you can kind of, okay, well, that, just like what Gendy's saying, where it's like, okay, let me consider that. And there's just more kind of, there's more time to let the ideas kind of grow organically at their own pace, you know, yeah. I like to think. Yeah, I mean, like, and as much as there's a lot of formulas to storytelling and, yeah. and everything, I really believe it, it, there's not. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's so mm -hmm. instinctual. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, Mark was saying too, it's like it's from your gut. And, yeah. you know, we could, you could read as many storybooks as you want, but if you don't have that natural instinct for story, you're never going to get it. Then you're just following formula. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to, you, sometimes you have to know where you're heading, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there is a, some, uh, you know, give and take and some just instincts that yeah. take over. The trust. You know, the trust. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I, I believe trust. this is the right idea. Maybe I can't yeah. defend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, know, yeah. you yeah. have people waving Robert McKee at you. Know, yeah. <laughs> right, right, Your right, first right. act <laughs> isn't <laughs> over in 10 <laughs> minutes. Well, Andrew, what are you yeah. doing? Yeah. <laughs> Andrew Stanton always puts it, it, well, he said to me, you know, there's going to come the point where you're going to feel like Columbus, you know, <laughs> and everyone's going to be going, where's the land? <laughs> you know, you said there's land. Right. You have to say, oh, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. And you know. It's not about finding land. <laughs> land. You it's know about what? Where we are a, right we're now. We're on a great life. journey, guys. <laughs> we're on are a we really having great fun journey. fishing? Yeah, 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 no scurvy. Remember, yeah. we brought all the We're all getting a tan. <laughs> yeah, it's all know, right. How is this not good? <laughs> <laughs> um, there seem to be uh, sort of small movements uh, back to 2D animation in some small ways. I mean, Disney has Paper Man. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 DreamWorks has Me and My Shadow, which mm -hmm. has some 2D elements. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think we'll see a, a feature made in that way in the next five years? Inevitably. Yeah. Inevitably, yeah. really? Sure, yeah. Yeah. I absolutely think absolutely. so. Yeah. It's just, Who's it's doing just, it? Raise your hand. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of smaller scale projects still, yeah. 2D, more and more every year. Yeah. And what's great about them is that they are tackling subject matter and storytelling that's completely outside of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that coming up actually in, in the Oscar submissions every year, more right. and more. Um, and that, that's encouraging to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Primarily from outside this country, it seems like, right? Uh, there is or certainly a lot in Europe that mm -hmm. I know of, mm -hmm. um, but I, it's never going to go away. And even even in stop mo, you know, there's so much stuff that initially starts with that 2D mm. sensibility. In mm -hmm. fact, even when I was we were planning this, um, I was working a lot with Tom Moore and Ross Stewart, who directed and art directed The Secret of Kells, mm -hmm. because I wanted somehow to try and embrace some of the 2D sensibilities mm -hmm. in a, in a three-dimensional world. But, I mean, we moved away from that in certain ways, but certain ideas remained, and a lot of our effects animation starts off in 2D, a lot of our facial animation starts off in 2D. Right. So it's always there, it's always present, yeah. I think. Right. I mean, I've, I've been pitching 2D movies for seven years. <laughs> you know, and, and the one thing... <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that I always run up against is that most studios want to make these movies that you're yeah, right. big budget with right. big uh, reward, hopefully. Right. You know? And I'm trying to convince them, well, in live action, you can have a small movie that right. makes a sensible amount of money. Right. Right. Why can't we make a $10 million movie? Mm -hmm. And you make $30 million. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not bad. You know, no, it's 300% profit. You know? <laughs> and, but the, the bigger studios, and we're starting these conversations, and, it's, and one of the reasons I took this job was to get in there and not just to prove myself, but also to start having this conversation like, mm -hmm. why can't we make a smaller animated film? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, less budget, bigger risk, more, you know, more uh, even interesting subject matter like, mm -hmm. the, you know, like Europe is doing all mm -hmm. over the place, Japan and stuff. Mm -hmm. And why can't we have that here? Mm -hmm. you know, we just can't have the same expectations. Right. You know? But my perfect scenario is like my big fat Greek wedding. Mm -hmm. you know, five million dollar movie, 235 million right. box office. Right. You know? mm -hmm. And like, that could be a story here in animation too, it, but it's just, you know, it's just hard to yeah to sell it and you know m most uh, studios are making less movies mm -hmm. and so the risk is great and it's you know it's a business so you right. try to find this business model yeah, that, it's, that it's, suits that in that it's the same old you know everybody wants to go on the cruise but nobody wants to be the first one on the boat you know but somebody somebody will do one you know I mean I, I, I would think you know looking at Samurai Jack and what you did with the Clone Wars stuff I mean to me, to me, it seems like a no-brainer that somebody like you could like do something that's just going to make a huge splash mm -hmm. and like re like redefine animation. Yeah, I I predict I predict <laughs> that somebody's going to do one that's going to like you know it's going to be the hit the right acupuncture pressure yeah. point and it's going to just spawn a whole legion of imitators. You so know? if you want to see it, America, call in right now. <laughs> right. Call in yeah. your phone. Five, five, five. five. <laughs> Make two. If you want director number candy, one to do it, dial zero zero one. I, I <laughs> mean, I, I love 2D, but I don't, I think it's the audiences are to blame. I'm going to stick it all on you, you know, Ooh. the audiences, Ooh, yes. because they, they, they're the ones who are actually going out and you know, almost by voting in a way of going to see what they're going to see and are attracted to what they're mm. going to see attracted. And I think you see this other thing happening, not just in, in, in 3D animation or in, in animation, but you start seeing, you're starting to see it big time in live action as live action is turning more yeah. into 3D animation mm -hmm. and 3D animation yeah, is kind of steering itself towards live action. I mean, they're, yeah. they're these weird cousins of each other, but it's all clashing together. And I think ultimately what's going to happen is that live action, animation, 2D, stop mo, whatever it is, are all going to be just considered genres like the Western and the romance mm -hmm. and a sci-fi and a fantasy movie or end up going to be. So that, you know, what I'm really interested in is I'm, why are we only, why is animation only G and PG? Why don't we having PG-13 and R-rated animated movies, mm -hmm. you know? Everything's going to be clashing together so it just becomes a genre uh, a specific, you know, yeah. niche, and that the stories out there to be doing it, you just decide what you want to do. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, I mean just, that's why. Sorry, just, sorry, just to argue that point for a second. Like, I don't blame the audience; I blame us, mm -hmm. because we started doing, you know, stagnant, repetitive, you know, referential 2D movies mm -hmm. that weren't new. It was like you could mm -hmm. see 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and so that killed it, mm -hmm. you know. And so, like, I, I believe that if we did Toy Story as a 2D movie, it would have been just as huge, because it's a great story with great characters and a great movie, mm -hmm. and we just stopped making great movies. Mm -hmm. 
And it's what attracted me to go to Leica in the first place because they're definitely not doing that. They are, you know, trying to do things that the other studios aren't. And I think they're succeeding. It's just that we want more people to see them, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but it's, it's why I definitely want to stay at Leica because it's fundamentally not treating stop mo as a genre. We, you know, Travis has said we, we, can, we can tell any story in this medium. And that's exciting to me. Um, it's just finding one that really catches, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, is it possible that just, you know, traditional features just isn't the way to bring, a, bring it back this time, if we're talking about like a 2D renaissance or something? Because, you know, there's the internet, there's, you know, there must be mm. some version of, you know, uh, on demand or, you know, uh, some sort of digital, uh, yeah, I just, I just wonder if the smarter way to do it is not going to be a different delivery system altogether. Mm -hmm. and I, think it's just, I think it's just that experience. Yeah, it's just that's true, watching the communal, some TV you know, drawings in the big yeah, screen. Yeah. It's well, yeah. It's, yeah. But it's, become, yeah. it's also an evolution. I mean, to go to black and white to color, to go to silent films yeah. to talkies, to go to 2D and to 3D. The amount of right. detail and the things that you can do, the audience is just craving. They're dying for it more. Not that the more, art doesn't have any more a, a value, forward, but you yeah. can't do whatever story did, did you want to do in, in the different mediums. So that's why yeah. I think it's, it's more the genre bases that you're doing them because you're going to expect that sort of thing. I mean, it's why some theaters, you know, it's a genre-based thing and some of the, you know, when you go to theater and you're watching Shakespeare versus Kabuki versus No versus whatever, right. you're going there and you've already preset yourself to what you're gonna get in that, in that kind of, of Your expectations element. Are set. You know, that yeah. there's, there's, there's a, there's a that, that's the platform that it is, you know, mm -hmm. the types of stories that you, you can tell. I mean, I remember when Akira came out, um, a Japanese animated film, it knocked my socks off because it's, a, it's R-rated, well the Japanese always do that, but, but the amount of animation that, that there was in it, it was like, you know, the Disney style was, you know, on ones and twos, it was fully animated, but they were treating it live, like live action too, but we haven't seen the like mm -hmm. of that in America still yet today at all, period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the, 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 the amount of space between that is freaking massive because well, here in the States, it's only for kids. Why do you think? Why do, is it? Is it the audience? Is it? The, it's. I think it's it the, totally the audience that there is a that there is a, a, a predominance or a thing in the head that it's only. It can't be. It can't be for some, adults. It can't be for adults. Well, I, yeah. I also think that the increasingly over the last twenty years, uh, you know, it's become more conservative. Yeah. Oh, totally. And parents yeah, oh, have become definitely. much more conservative oh, yeah. as to what they think their kids should be watching, yeah. uh -huh. and not always in the right way. Right, yeah. You know, not, we're not talking about violence here because that seems to be acceptable no matter what. Right. Um, but just, you know, in terms of what, what socially they, they want their kids to receive by watching. A lot of movies have just become, I think, for parents, a means for them to occupy their children and they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to explain it. They don't yeah. have to have a conversation about mm. it afterwards. And that's fine, um, but it shouldn't be all kids' movies, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> you know, that reminds me of a test screening that we actually did on Wreck-It Ralph, that just thinking about that right now, that when you said, was it too scary or were people afraid, no one complained, you know, about it being too violent or too scary. But there was a note, I'm sorry, I'm hitting my microphone a lot. But there was a note um, that we got from one lady because we have two characters kiss, you know? <laughs> she said, well, that, that kiss lingered just a little too long. Yeah. It's like, well. <laughs> you can blow people their, away by right, 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 right. kissing. <laughs> it's it's what about two the people. Arm? You know, yeah. It's like the, the love story. This is the payoff to the love story. And it's nothing more than a kiss. Well, it just kind of made me a little <laughs> Wow. Two people kissing, you know, a man and a woman kissing, right. you know, so. Yeah, we didn't it, get it, nothing it, for the naked butts and brave at all. So I, right. Nudity, <laughs> yeah, nudity but, and violence. <laughs> but have the two lovers yeah. kiss on we got, screen? We got it's where's like, the prince? Why can't there be a love interest for, yeah. for, yeah. for marriage? Was, there, was that yeah. a big deal? Then? Oh, it was a big deal. It was a big, wow. That's really? what people miss the most, you know, or or that, you know. Why didn't she get We wanted guys. more dude to be saved. Yeah, uh -huh. and that, that, that the bear, after the bear died, you know, the, the prince, the spell would be broken. There he'd be. And it's the secret love interest waiting in the wings to come yeah. out. It's like, it's you, people nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you people nuts. I mean, they're so chained down to these things yeah, that have conventions. been in place, these yeah. conventions. It's just like.
break the chain. People. Well, and I think the the key to that is to kind of turn the conventions on there. Exactly. Right. You know, exactly. you just have to kind of yeah. spin it a different way. You know, to, and that's. I don't think you can break them, no. you know, right before their eyes that that hard. It, mm -hmm. You need to start by but spinning I think, them I think that's a little happening. bit. I think all then, of this, it, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, cumulatively, yeah. over the years, I don't know how many years, but cumulatively, I think we are moving in a, in a good direction. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just that. Well, look at all these different movies. Right. Yeah, they look completely. Yeah. They look completely different, you know. And if these if these spawn more babies of more different yeah, yeah, things yeah, and yeah. you know stuff like that and, and have other filmmakers take more risks in the type of movies that we're doing all well the just better. the different mediums like with, yeah. the, with Leica with mm. Frankenweenie you know that you had stop motion the, you know there it, it, different genres yeah. Right. you know it's, yeah there's new ways yeah. to I think that we can use the technologies that we have there to you know in 2d and, and stop yeah. mo mocap 3d just to blend and different ways that we can put them together to find new and you know unique uh, uh, visual styles to tell well, a movie. And, and each one of them has just very profound stories at yeah. their heart mm -hmm. too. Yeah. You know, and I don't think you can say that for all the live action films. No. Right? You know, yeah. That, yeah. that I think that somewhere animation is like you said, it's becoming more like live action in the sense emotionally, you know, that mm -hmm. there, right. there are stories that are more profound being made in animation than I think in, in your average live action movie. They're, they're becoming a little bit more like cartoons or, mm -hmm. and, and, not, and I'm not saying that in a good way, you know, yeah. not, you know, we love cartoons, you know, <laughs> but I'm saying that it's, be, they're becoming more, you know, kind of, uh, they're more ambitious. I mean, they're yeah, more they're big, ambitious, but a little all yeah. spectacle, but very kind of surface. Yeah, you know, where well, we there's really there's a heart to each one of them. You know, that yeah. we concentrate yeah. on versus the, the live action. And they're going for whatever the gimmick is, or mm -hmm. you know, it just seems more superficial so, in a lot of the live action yeah. movies that I see these days. Because I know with this whole group here, it's like we, you know, we hone and hone and hone mm -hmm. the story to to really give it some meaning. So mm -hmm. as you're watching the movie, it's it means something mm -hmm. to you, whether it's right. about, you know, a father and a daughter or yeah. mother and, you know, and, and daughter. It's, it, it, it resonates. That's mm -hmm. why I think right. like animated films today resonate mm -hmm. more with the audience than, right. than their uh, live action siblings. You want, you want your movie to have an impact on a kid. Right. That right. one of those movies made on, on us. us. Right. Yeah. You know? Right. Because I bet we could go down the line and each person yeah. could say, oh, yeah. like, I remember seeing blank, <laughs> right. you right. know, and from that moment on, I knew I wanted, and that's, I think that's what we're all chasing. That was yeah. the, almost know? the whole point of our movie was that yeah. kind of like mysterious movie that you saw when you were four and just mm -hmm. remember, yeah. you know, a few isolated things from it now, but just yeah. capturing that feeling. But it's the, it's the kind of catalyst, I think, that makes each one of us kind of chase this dream of, you know, sharing our version of that thing from the past with another kid, you know, It's like today. it's a feeling, like I remember when we first started working on Star Wars. It's like, oh my God, Star Wars, you know, yeah. what are we gonna do? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously loving, all of us loving it as, as, as kids and adults, and then, like we start talking about the details, and it's like, well, you know, it's not about the details. Right. It's about the feeling. It's how it made like, you feel. I want to feel like I'm watching Star around. Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And that's, yeah. mm -hmm. and you start to realize we're duplicating, like, you know, Rich is saying, we're duplicating feeling, and like, okay, well, what is Star Wars, and why does it make me feel like right. that? And try to get those elements in there. Is it the sound effects, the timing, the kind of things yeah. we're doing to feel like, oh, yeah, it feels like Star Wars, even though it looks completely different. Mm -hmm. Right. It still has that feeling that it, it gives out. And that is true. I mean, like, we were always trying to, you know, like with Hotel T, Transylvania, I was trying to get like an energy, like a, you're watching a Bugs Bunny movie, right. you know, mm -hmm. to get that feeling from you, like you're watching something so comedic and silly and funny, mm -hmm. and it's tonally so different and so broad that you just smile and it's mm -hmm. all entertaining, right. you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, and it is, it is the key. And that's such a, such a more, like, you know, last few years I've been thinking about it, so much more sophisticated, sophisticated thing where you're like, you're putting all these abstract images together to create a feeling mm -hmm. right. and a mood. Mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. You know, that's where the daunting things like, oh no, I just see these pictures, I don't see it. Yeah, what? We, yeah. <laughs> Did I create the right feeling? Right. It's, you know? It seems like all of these projects as well are, have a big nostalgic element to them. 
too. We, yeah. we, partly the feeling, but also yeah. that's an interesting observation. The subject matter. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. 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 I wish we could go on. It is so interesting to talk to you guys, but we have to wrap. Um, we're thank you so much. We're just getting started. Now. We're, get, we're really getting to the now, middle. I thought that yeah. was the warm-up. Yeah. I hope Wait, in a few now. years we're back here and we've got a 2D movie and we've Absolutely. got a PG-13 movie and now, we've got... Well, Brave 2, Guardians of the Knock on um, some wood quick. Yeah. But thank you so much for being thank here. You. It was really a treat. Thank you. Thank you.